Hi, good day everyone. So my name is Rhea Andrews and I'm currently the program assistant at Data and Projects. And I would like to welcome everyone to Data and Projects first webinar for the year 2022. And it's entitled The Exploration and Application of Art Materials in the Work of Five Trimigonian Artists, Implications for Art Conservation in Trinidad and Tobago. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, we are hoping that this is this will not be the first or last opportunity for us to meet and if you would like to be placed on our mailing list please place your addresses in the chat thank you um so just to note as well everyone should know that this session will be recorded so it's recorded from now so a bit about data and projects developing arts and design awareness and Projects is a registered not-for-profit organization established in Trinidad and Tobago in 2011. The broad aim of data and projects is to facilitate the development and installation of public arts in Trinidad and Tobago in ways which enhance and protect the physical environment and support the surrounding communities through collaborations, partnerships, and support networks for arts and artistic ecological projects that are environmentally sustainable. For more information, you guys can feel free to check out our Facebook page, Data and Projects, our Instagram page, as well as our Medium page. So for today's conversation, we will be having a webinar featuring Lucy Fallows. She's a British art conservator and she'll be in conversation with Maya Cooper and she is a Trinbegonian journalist. So Lucy is currently a freelance painter, painting conservator in London. She gained an undergraduate degree in French and art history from St. Andrews University in Scotland. In 2018, Lucy decided to pursue her love of paintings and began a postgraduate diploma in the conservation of easel paintings at the Cotold Institute of Art in London. While completing her final year dissertation, Lucy met and interviewed several artists living in Trinidad and Tobago, sparking her interest in Caribbean and in particular, Trinbegonian contemporary art. Maya Cooper is a journalism graduate from the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. She has a passion for the communications, cultural and creative industries. Maya is currently a freelance photographer, a digital transformation specialist, and co-founder of Sunday Market Network. Through all of her work, she ensures that each endeavor is rooted in community building while simultaneously maintaining her goals of inclusivity and justice. Now, I welcome Lucy Fellows to commence her presentation which will be followed by a conversation between Lucy Fellows and Maya Cooper. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm just uh, currently trying to share my screen. I think, uh, Raya, if you could. Uh, give me permission and then I can begin. I say good evening, it's evening here. I think it's afternoon still in Trinidad. So hi, wherever you may be in the world. <laughs> ah, there we go, perfect. Okay. Uh, alrighty. Okay, um, so as uh, Raya mentioned, I'm a painting conservator based in London. Um, and in September last year, I graduated with a postgraduate degree in the conservation of easel paintings. Um, so in the final year of this programme, each student completes a research project into a topic of their choosing. Um, so having met um, artist Dean Arlen, uh, who I think is also joining us today, um, in Gießen, Germany in 2019, I became a lot more interested in Trinidadian art 
um, and therefore decided to base my project on the painting methods and materials of contemporary artists working in the country. Um, so understanding how artists create their work is an important part of conservation. Uh, through research and conducting interviews uh, with artists, we can gain invaluable insights into their working practices and the materials and methods used in their paintings. Um, this information can then help inform conservation treatments or interventions in the future. So despite a recent interest amongst the art world um, of, uh, uh, amongst the art world of um, art and artists whose work falls outside of the typical canon of Western art history, I noticed that very few studies had been conducted into the materiality of artists based in the Caribbean. Um, and therefore, I decided to rectify this and increase knowledge in this field. So I interviewed uh, five artists who live and work in Trinidad and Tobago. So here you can see uh, just some images of the artists. I'm sure some of you who are joining us on the call may also be familiar um, and have met the artists themselves. Uh, but they were Dean Artland, Mackenna Kunle, Shalini Sariram, Edward Bowen and Peter Doig. So these five artists reflect, uh, reflect the demographic of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and also through their subject matter and creative processes, they depict contemporary Caribbean life, ranging from carnival culture, rural boredoms, issues with colonialism and homosexuality, to name just a few. So I will begin by briefly introducing the work of each artist before placing their artistic processes in a broader art historical context to discover what, if anything, characterizes their work. And this is a very sort of brief, um, I guess, summarization of my project. There's, if anyone's interested, if you want to pop your email, I can always, or if you want to get in touch with me after this, I can always email you the full project, uh, which has a lot more sort of technical analysis and details um, if you want to get into that. So we'll begin with Dean Arlen. So Dean was born in Pacarigua, Trinidad. Um, in 1990, he gained a diploma in jewelry design from the John Donaldson Technical Institute. And in 1992, he earned a Commonwealth scholarship to study sculpture and ins installation art at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Canada. When he returned to Trinidad in 1995, Arlen described the difficulties of practicing installation art and reverted to the studio painting in a collage and assemblage format. And I think if anyone's there, I think you, we can actually see the artist sort of working <laughs> uh, while we're speaking. So this is a nice little uh, summary of sort of, you know, live action, <laughs> uh, live action artist in the wild. So Arlen's painting style is self-taught. He is an active member of the Trinidadian art community and frequently shares ideas with other artists. Um, Arlen's training in jewellery design and installation art has lent a multidisciplinary aspect to his painting style and technique. His creative process is complex and his paintings are characterised by textured surfaces of mixed media. And there's a couple of examples um, here on the screen just for you to sort of visualise his work. His paintings often explore notions of masculinity, the urban environment and everyday life in Trinidad and Tobago. Many of his paintings are created using layers of paper glued with wood glue onto prime canvas, which he stretches himself. Arlen is not particular about the paper he uses to build these layers, using white copy paper, assorted papers he finds in the urban environment, old posters, or even paper that's been thrown away. Occasionally using stencils, Arlen builds layers of enamel spray paint, paper, acrylic, and oil paint, which he then sands down, searching for the final composition. And here, these are some details that um, the artist sent me during my research, um, because I forgot to mention, but sadly I couldn't make it to Trinidad uh, due to the pandemic. So most of my research was conducted over Zoom like this, um, sort of talking to the artists and then sort of me messaging, emailing them, and they very kindly sent me sort of photos and uh, this and that to help out. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yeah, he applies, um, Arlen applies paint using different techniques to create his desired gritty effect. The finer details are added with either oil or acrylic paint, a brush and ink. 
This working process is energetic and experimental. Arlen is heavily influenced by Dada, street art and rural environment, and his paintings are gritty and confrontational. And there's, this is a really great image that just sort of shows uh, this, um, I guess so you can visualize the uh, way that he builds up layers using glue and paper, and it shows just how thick uh, these layers actually are. And this is um, a really unique uh, working practice that I personally have never seen in an artwork before. So yeah, it's, it was a really interesting thing to, uh, for me to learn at least. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, there are probably other artists uh, painting in a similar manner. Um, so, Makemba Kunle was born in Lavenkill, Trinidad in 1950, and he arose as one of Trinidad and Tobago's most promising artists in the 1970s. Previously working as a teacher, Kunle was involved in Trinidad and Tobago's Black Power movement that began in February 1970, as thousands of young people took to the streets and demonstrations, dissatisfied with institutional racism and a lack of employment opportunities post-independence. Kunle made posters, leaflets, and magazines supporting the movement. During this time, the artist said that he was doing more work outside of the classroom than inside, and he therefore decided to follow a career path as an artist, exhibiting for the first time at the age of 40 as a self-taught artist. He's also made it his mission to create opportunities to support and encourage younger artists in the wider region of the Caribbean, co-finding Studio 66 Art Support Community at his home in Barataria. And here we can see Kunle um, working on a number of paintings that the artist uh, sent me again during my uh, research period. So Kunle has a very distinctive style to his work, the textured details that sit above geometric swirling patterns. Throughout his career, Kunle has painted the environment and objects that surround him, mostly people, love, women, and carnival. He's also interested in notions of identity, especially in post-colonial societies. Kunle uses recycled materials in his art. However, for the market, he generally paints on paper or linen and cotton canvas. He buys most of his supplies locally, as he doesn't like the idea of importing materials. According to Kunle, the artist is supposed to be the example of independence and resourcefulness. We should really find things here that we can work with. Kunle's painting compositions are simultaneously spontaneous and planned. Each painting begins with layered of colored acrylic paint, building up the background. Using chalk, Kunle draws his composition onto the background, inspired by drawings in his sketchbook. The artist was first introduced to acrylic when he started painting and he prefers its handling properties compared to oil paint. He described his work as pointillistic in style. Acrylic paint therefore allows the artist to build up these pointillistic layers in his paintings, allowing him to explore philosophical ideas through his material choices. And here you can see I took some cross sections uh, from this painting that the artist sent me um, and uh, conducted some research on it. Um, and basically a cross section is you take a little sort of fleck or a, or a sample of paint uh, from the painting and you set it in uh, clear resin. And that allows you to sort of see I guess almost like a cake, all the layers. It's like when you cut into a cake and you can see all the layers um, within the painting. So here we can see that, you know, it's obviously a very multicolored painting, but you can also see the layer process um, that the artist uh, spoke about. And we can also see examples of quick application where the paint sort of mixes um, and you have what's called wet in wet mixing, where um, as the artist is painting, he's picking up layers from the under underlying paint layers. Um, so, fine, uh, we'll move on to Shalini Sariram. So, born in a remote part of Trinidad in 1972, Shalini Sariram has been painting stylized portraits, particularly of the female form, since 1999. Shalini studied graphic and jewelry design at John S. Donaldson Technical Institute. Excelling in the latter, she was awarded a President's Medal, medal for her jewelry designs in 1997. Again, the artist is a self-taught painter and incorporates elements from her graphic and jewelry design into her paintings. 
Shalini's paintings explore LGBTQ plus culture in Trinidad and Tobago. She was the first female artist to publicly, publicly display paintings depicting scenes of intimacy uh, between the same sex. And homosexuality was only decriminalized in Trinidad and Tobago in 2018. And the discourse therefore surrounding LGBTQ plus rights has not yet permeated mainstream realms. Shalini began painting um, early in her career using nail polish on paper as she couldn't afford art materials. Nail polish was cheap, easily available, and she could buy an assortment of colors. Like paint, however, the pigments in some nail polish she's found have faded and changed um, color when exposed to sunlight. Um, these days, however, the artist paints mostly with acrylic, um, but she still uses nail polish for the finer details in her works. Um, and this painting here on the right, I think is one of the artist's painting where she's incorporated nail polish um, for a few of these details sort of on the um, decorative uh, uh, material. Um, so the artist's humble beginnings have instilled a sense of economy of use, applying paint sparingly. Shalini paints mostly on pre-stretched and primed canvas. However, she's not limited to canvas and paint on board. And she also paints on board, paper, and other materials. Her work has evolved from simple lines, forms, and color when she started painting in 2000 to the more detailed faces and abstracted entwined figures um, that, she be, that she has now become synonymous with. Shalini's training in graphic and jewelry design is evident in her incorporation of not only bold repeating patterns, but also her inclusion of found objects such as metal wire, wood, fabric, bottle caps, and old window panes. And again, this painting here on the right is a really great example of the artist's uh, incorporation of found objects. It's painted in an old window frame. Um, and we've got uh, the background is made from sort of uh, flattened down bottle caps um, that the artist has collected. And there's also the inclusion of uh, all sorts of, I guess, little metal wires and, and and um, inclusions that the artist creates the ornate uh, decoration in her painting. Um, so through her, um, through the artist's reappropriation of, uh, of colors and, and found objects, um, she celebrates the East Indian population of Trinidad and Tobago, and therefore uh, elevates through her reappropriation of these elements, um, the Indo-Trinidadian culture in her artworks. So moving on to Edward Bowen. Um, Bowen was born in Port of Spain in 1963. Between 1972 and 81, he attended boarding school in the UK. While at school, Bowen made the most of school trips to museums and galleries in London, visiting the National Gallery and the Tate, for example. These visits, according to the artist, inspired his own work with the energy present in the work. Having been introduced to paintings by the likes of Mark Rothko and Gerhard Richter, the, uh, Bowen decided to follow a career in painting and gained a higher national diploma in painting and printmaking in 1985 from Croydon College. The artist moved back to Trinidad and Tobago in the same year to establish a studio. These days, Bowen spends his time between Port of Spain and his home and studio in San Susi on the northeast coast of Trinidad. His paintings often depict abstracted landscapes, figures and scenery, characterized by bold colors and his quick handling of paint. Bowen evades political statements in his work. For him, the act of creating is the most important. He paints predominantly on canvas, which he stretches himself with cotton or linen sourced in Trinidad. He favors canvas compared to board or wood, as he explained that canvas has a spring and that his movements on the canvas are big. So there needs to be some kind of give with the painting. Bowen's paintings on canvas are strictly acrylic. In the past, however, he has experimented with oil paints, but for him, it was too messy and didn't achieve what he wanted out of painting. So he switched to um, acrylics early on in his career. Painting is a very physical act for Bowen. 
he stands and paints often working on two or more paintings simultaneously. He applies paint with a brush and occasionally makes use of his hand, pushing paint around the canvas or scratching into the paint with a brush. And uh, I think so here you can sort of see these striations where he's, um, I guess, using tools. To, um, it, you can see the experimental feel of the work. It's very quick. It's, it's, um, it's spontaneous. Um, so thinner washes of acrylic paint mixed with rainwater can also drip down the surface as it's applied, whereas other passages of paint are rather impasto in their application. Barnes' works often begin with one intention and end in a completely different direction. His paintings are spontaneous and instinctive. The artist changes his story partway through. Much like Trinidadian culture, Bowen's paintings are constantly evolving and shifting narrative. And the final artist who I did research into was Peter Doig. So born in Edinburgh in 1959, Peter Doig moved to Trinidad and Tobago as a child in 1962 before relocating to Canada in 1966. He moved to London in 1979 to study painting at initially the St. Martin's School of Art, and then he completed an MA at Chelsea College of Art in 1991. Doig quickly achieved success, winning the Whitechapel Artist Prize in 1991. Despite rejecting contemporary trends, the artist won the John Moores Prize for Blotter in 1993, which is the painting on the screen, and he was nominated for the Turner Prize in 1994. In 2000, Doig was invited to, fellow, um, to join fellow British artist Chris O'Feely on a residential programme in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, he then moved to the islands in 2002 and established a studio. Um, the artist remains an active member of the Trinidadian art scene and community and spends his time now between London, uh, New York and Trinidad. So Doig's paintings typically depict figurative scenes and landscapes, often inspired by photos, magazines and postcards he has collected over the years. Since moving to Trinidad, he swapped depicting snowy scenes of skiers, mountains and sparse woodlands for moonlit beaches, tropical forests, and mystifying figures. Doig's paintings nonetheless avoid facile depictions as the, of the voyeuristic exoticism so typical of many other European painters in his position. The artist typically paints on canvas or linen. Since the beginning of the, the, his career, he's primed his canvas with rabbit skin glue, which he says behaves differently in Trinidad compared to when he works in Europe or the US. This is most likely due to the humidity and heat um, of a tropical country. Throughout his career, the artist has used oil paint, often thinned with solvents to create washes. However, due to health reasons, um, he's made a few changes uh, since he started his career and has experimented using pigments in a binder medium. Although better for his health, the artist said, nothing for me is as good as oil paint really, or as strange as oil paint. I like the way oil paint behaves when you don't control it. Strange things can start to happen to the material. Many of his painting techniques have evolved due to his, the artist's willingness to explore and exploit his materials. Um, so the landscape buildings and people of Trinidad have also influenced Doig's subject matter. The colors of the island have inspired his work, especially the colors of the houses. Doig also shared a studio space for a number of years with Trinidadian artist and musician Ember. Um, and the two artists had a very close working relationship. And this painting, Man Dressed as Bat, um, Doig said it was inspired by a small um, uh, carving that uh, Ember uh, had made and I think gifted to the artist, if I remember correctly. Um, so, Doig's move to Trinidad has facilitated chance encounters and incidents. He embraces these external forces to guide his painting process. Um, so, I'll now move on to talk about some of the most interesting uh, material choices, techniques and processes employed by the artist um, that I studied in my project, and I'll focus um, mostly on their use of acrylic paint and the incorporation of collage and assemblage techniques in their painting. 
So both economic factors and availability have influenced the material choices of the artists. Acrylic paint is cheaper and more available in Trinidad and Tobago compared to oil paint. Since the 1960s, in fact, oil emulsion paints have become a staple in the artist's paint market, challenging the dominance of oil painting. These modern paints provided artists with a whole range of new possibilities to explore and have made an incredible impact on the unfolding history of 20th and 21st century art. So Bowen, Arlen, Kunle and Shalini's use of acrylic emulsion paint is simultaneously practical, economic and philosophical. The properties of acrylic paint allow Bowen to easily create these thin paint washes um, that he mixes with water without losing the desired pigmentation. Uh, similarly, Kunle exploits these properties to create his intricate paintings of multiple layers. And with, due to its high covering nature, um, acrylic paint allows Fellini to experiment painting on a range of supports, including canvas, wood, and even old doors and door frames. So these artists' use of acrylic is even more significant considering that Kunle, Fellini, and Arlen did not formally train in painting. Their use of materials is not rooted in academic traditions. Their art questions notions of identity, and their use of acrylic paint reinforces these ideas and represents a resistance to dominant cultures playing on the dichotomies of old and new, dominant and emergent. Their multidisciplinary approach to painting mirrors the multiculturalism of Trinidadian society. Artists in Trinidad and Tobago embrace experimentation in their painting. Arlen and Shalini's incorporation of found objects and their collage and assemblage techniques are particularly noteworthy. Through their use of collage in their paintings, Shalini and Arlen expand those parameters of what should be considered art. Shalini celebrates not only her own Indo-Trinidadian identity, but also women and the LGBTQ plus community through her assemblage pieces. Her incorporation of found objects elevates the quotidian, giving a voice to those who may not often be heard. Arlen has openly spoken about the influence of Dada upon his work and talking to art historian Marsha Pierce in 2013, Arlen called his work a post-colonial Dada. He said, the Dada movement raged against the space at the time. My work attempts to do that, to rage against the system and deconstruct power. So Arlen's appropriation of avant-garde collage techniques questions notions of originality and recurring issues in contemporary society through his own artistic lens. And finally, Trinidadian artist Christopher Cozier has argued the that the difference between Trinidadian art of the 60s and 70s and the current generation is a shift from representing culture to creating culture. However, we cannot underestimate the influence previous generations has, have had upon contemporary Trinidadian artists. Trinidad has always had some influence on Doig's work, whether consciously or subconsciously. He said, I think lots of Trinidadian artwork that I've seen on the street has inspired my work. The urban environment, including street signs, and the bold use of colour in Trinidad is reflected in his colour palette since his move. Arlen's use of materials such as spray paint and bold colours is a direct reference to the street art and materials of previous generations. Although earlier artists were, according to Cozier, representing culture, their approaches have paved the way for contemporary artists to develop, to develop their own methods of creating culture and making art in Trinidad and Tobago. So what I found from my study and my research is that contemporary Trinidadian art scene is diverse and exciting. Artists are not limited to traditional methods of painting, nor by canon canonical art history allowing for experimentation in their choice of materials and techniques. Although the work of Arlen Kunle, Shalini, Bowen and Doi varies in style and subject matter, they all demonstrate a sense of resourcefulness. A poster found in the street is elevated to the realms of fine art. Drips caused by rainwater are celebrated rather than concealed. Although their methods of application of paint is not necessarily unusual, their willingness to see anything as an art material is significant. This sense of improvisation connects their artistic processes. Their hybrid use of materials and techniques reflects not only the multiculturalism of the country, but is also a strategy of empowerment against dominant forms of making art, 
a resistance that is even more significant in post-colonial societies. So this project represents only a cross-section of painted practices in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's my opinion that far more research um, and technical examination should be conducted into the artistic processes um, and materiality of artists living and working in the country. The art of Trinidad and Tobago has been shaped by continuous exchanges and it's therefore only fitting that new exchanges are forged in the future. Um, so that concludes my uh, presentation um, and a very brief insight into my research. I'll stop sharing. And I think I need to make uh, Raya a host again. There we go. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, Lucy, for that very You're welcome. detailed presentation. So now <laughs> we open up the floor for the conversation between Maya Cooper and Lucy Phelps. Um, Lucy, I want to say thank you for that amazing presentation. I am <laughs> intrigued. I myself want to see that presentation and just see layers, just seeing the layers of being work and stuff like that is really interesting. Um, so me, myself, like, even though I am a part of this conversation, I'm also intrigued in the, the, the conversation around conservation. So mm -hmm. before we dive into the whole world, of conservation. I want you to tell me a little bit about yourself and how you, you yourself became a conservator and what led you to specialize in easel paintings specifically. Uh, yeah, um, so I guess as, um, as Raya mentioned at the start, I studied French and art history um, for my undergrad. Um, and I guess I sort of got to the end of my degree and thought, oh, I don't really know what I want to do. I guess I like a lot of a lot of people, you know, when you're sort of facing the end of something and trying to find a career, you, you don't necessarily know what's out there. Um, and I was in I did a year abroad in Paris because I studied French as well. And um, I actually saw them restoring uh, a painting by Gustave Courbet at the Musée d'Orsay. And they were doing it sort of uh, in situ, so behind like a glass, um, I guess, casing, so to speak. Um, and I thought, oh, that's really interesting, because I think we all know that conservation is something that goes on, but we don't necessarily see it. It's kind of concealed. Um, so, I, I, you know, that sort of piqued my interest. And I thought, well, how, how does one become a conservator? So I did a little bit of research and found out that luckily, if you studied art history, you can sort of enter it via that route. So I entered it from an, um, an art history route. Um, and yeah, that was it really. Um, and three years later after postgraduate degrees, I'm now working as a painting conservator. Um, I think also the second part of your question was why did I choose easel paintings? Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, Oh, why easels? I guess I've always personally been drawn to paintings. Um, I don't know, I just like the energy about them. You know, whenever I was young and I went to a gallery, that's what I sort of was drawn to. Um, but I mean, there's all sorts of different fields of conservation that you can follow, you know, there's sculpture, there's uh, paper, um, and they're all textiles, and they're all such different fields that, you know, it's so varied and specialized, you just don't know. I would, you know, I would never, I would never even know where to begin conserving a sculpture. Um, so yeah, it's it's a really interesting um, field. I think also the nice thing about paintings is, from a more practical point of view, they can, you know, they can be taken off the wall and they can come to you. So while it can create opportunities that you can travel, you can also sort of be a bit more stable if you want so it it's for me I thought it was a nice career path um yeah I hope that's answered that question 
actually answered the question perfectly. So oh. what is the significance of conservation in contemporary society, especially with the context of the climate crisis that is happening regionally and globally? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I guess the significance of conservation in contemporary society is that we're preserving cultural heritage for future generations to benefit from. Um, and they can hopefully learn and gather some kind of inspiration from uh, from artists of the past. Um, however, that's also, I guess, quite a deep philosophical question. Um, because you think, you know, why why conserve one thing and maybe not another? What what makes one thing eligible for conservation and this other thing isn't? Yeah. Um, and there's been, yeah, in the field, there's been a lot of, I guess, debate about this topic, you know, and there's a whole sort of uh, ethics guidelines on what we conserve, why we conserve it. I guess there are a number of factors that can contribute towards what, what might be conserved or what might be treated, um, for example, like the meanings and what, what it means to certain different groups, um, ideological meanings, sentimental meanings, for example, for different people. And that can have an impact on, I guess, favoring one, one object over another, not that I'd ever want to. Um, but, uh, how the art itself is articulated, conserving that specifically as well. The what? Sorry, the art is conserving how the art is articulated because obviously each stroke and each detail tells the, the meaning of the piece itself, no matter the yeah. medium that is used. Yeah, you're completely right. Like the sort of you know one brush stroke here could completely change the meaning of the artwork. So. Yeah, we we don't we don't rep, well we replicate we don't add new things in. <laughs> so how um, do artists benefit from this art conservation? Um, I guess they can. How do artists benefit? That is a good question. Well, I guess if a damage happens, um, especially contemporary artists, because. Obviously, you have contemporary conservation, you have uh, conservation of older paintings where the artists are no longer alive. Um, but, you know, if the damage happens, and it does with contemporary artworks, accidents happen, uh, we're there to sort of help. And uh, if there's a tear, we mend the tear. Um, I guess the nice thing is that we are able to liaise with artists. Um, so if there is an accident, we can actually talk to the artists and ask, like, what, what did you use? Um, and therefore we kind of know how that material is going to behave, um, how it might be damaged. Um, and of course, I'm a conservator isn't going to change the artwork. That's not for us to do. But let's say there was a big tear that happened in the center of a painting. We'd fix it so you wouldn't be able to see the tear. It's sort of hopefully that's what we try to do. It just disappears and it's no longer disrupting. Um, but I guess an artist could say that that's not what they like and they could come in and paint a new bit into the composition that sort of hides it. So it's their artwork. They can do what they like with it. Um, but at the same time, there's a, a branch of conservation called um, conservation science. So scientists, conservation scientists are continuously uh, researching painting materials um, to understand what might happen to them, how, how they might age in the future. Um, and also uh, a lot of suppliers change their formulas. So this might affect um, the way that paint dries, the way that it, it's handled. Um, so the conservation scientists do a lot of research. Um, I don't know so much about this field because I do more practical conservation, um, but they're const constantly doing research um, into artist materials to understand how they might mitigate problems. Um, and also then uh, for, for future, for, the, for conservation issues that may arise with these like changes in formulas. So I guess it's a two way stream, you know, you can always, uh, the more you talk to different people, the more everyone benefits, I think. 
Um, so in terms of materiality, I remember you were saying um, Peter expressed that his materials and the paint that he used and his it behaved differently depending on the climate. Um, so how does the climate in Trinidad and Tobago and by extension the whole entire Caribbean region affect the conservation process? So like how are materials affected and what can be done to aid in the conservation process of artwork? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting uh, uh, question. And as you said, you know, um, Peter uh, experienced issues uh, with materials that he'd used. Um, obviously, Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean region is a tropical climate, so it's hot and humid um, for most of the year, if not all of the year. Um, and it has a relative hum humidity of around 80%. So for an artwork to be stable um, in the field of conservation, we say that humidity should be kept at around 50%. Uh, so obviously 80 is a lot higher um, than that. So I guess you've also got to think about, you know, what is a painting? Um, and, you know, all the different elements that make up a typical painting, obviously, as I explored, you know, not every painting is typical and it's made up of multiple different uh, mediums that artists themselves like to experiment with but typically you know it's canvas or wood uh, you've got a ground layer or a priming layer um, such as animal skin glue or a protein layer um, you have paint layers and then sometimes artists varnish their paintings so that's sort of the typical layer structure that we would find um, and then you've got to think that all of these elements are responding differently two changes in humidity and heat. So that can then cause, I guess, issues with cracking, flaking paint, um, layers that aren't sort of sticking to one another and it can create like really bad problems. Um, so that's how, I guess, how the climate of Trinidad and Tobago can affect, maybe not necessarily the conservation process, but the actual paintings. Um, and there are a number of things that you can do to mitigate against uh, some of these issues. Um, for example, um, you can buy uh, dehumidifiers. So these, um, I'm not sure how much they cost. I think they range, you know, in price depending on what kind of model you get. But, you know, it's, it's obviously a difficult question because um, not everyone you know, you, not everyone can afford to buy all these, all this equipment that you need. However, mm -hmm. I really would recommend if you have sort of a significant collection of artworks in your home um, that you really love and cherish, then yeah, there are a few sort of um, elements you can put in place. For example, the dehumidifier, um, trying to keep, uh, you know, considering the light in, in the Caribbean, it's a lot sunnier than here in the UK most of the time. Um, and UV, direct exposure to UV can cause pigments to fade. So that's just like easy things to consider, you know, not, not placing your painting right opposite a window where it's in direct sunlight. Um, all of that kind of thing, which is quite easy. Um, also glazing paintings as well. You can now buy um, glazing, so like uh, glass or perspex that has uh, UV filters in. So that's gonna also stop that sort of pigment fading process. Um, and then also um, something that conserv uh, conservators do a lot is using backboards. So we make backboards that sort of fit into the back of the painting. Um, and this just stops, I guess, it's, it's quite complex physics, but it stops the painting from, I guess, when the fibres expand, um, the fibres in the canvas expand and then contract, um, it's, it's meant to mitigate against that. So it supposedly stops uh, flaking paint and cracks forming. Um, and, you know, it's relatively cheap and quite easy to do. So there are things you know, not all hope is lost because of the climate. <laughs> That's good to know, and especially for the artists on this call and for artists in general, to know this information so they could preserve their own art. And people who um, indulge and love to consume art, buy art in all regards, 
is information that they would love to know as well so they could preserve their own art. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, generally, most of the artists that you interviewed, they use traditional materials. So what space is there for the use of indigenous and innovative materials? Um, I mean, I think there's always a space for any kind of materials. I mean, yeah, I think, as I said, it's, it's the artists were using more conventional materials, but I guess using them in unconventional manners. Um, but also, you know, I only interviewed five artists. So although I guess it's a sort of a cross section of, of what's going on in Trinidad at the moment in the contemporary art scene, um, that doesn't mean that there aren't artists out there who aren't using, uh, as you said, sort of indigenous um, materials and if they are, I'd love, you know, if anyone's listening, I'd love to uh, hear that. So, yeah, get in touch <laughs> if you are, because <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So, Well, I um, guess but, yeah. if there's anyone, um, a part of the webinar right now, that in, uses Indigenous innovative materials and they know about our process, they could always send in a question. And anyone in general who wants to send in a question, we'll be answering questions after. So you could just type it into the chat and we will answer after. So how does, we, we talked about the whole conservation process, um, what, how it, things are affected with the climate, the materials that we use, but how does an individual become a conservator and what is the educational background that aids in the, in the journey to, into conservation? Yeah, that's a good, um, good question. Uh, so previously a lot of people would sort of just do internships, um, or you know, work with the studio, but now the um, I guess the field has become a lot more regulated, and there's governing bodies. So, uh, so now you have to at least to practice in the UK. I'm not sure about other countries. Um, you have to have completed a postgraduate course uh, in conservation. So there's three places in the UK where you can study. There's the Courtauld. Um, where I've studied, there's um, somewhere in Cambridge that's part of the University of Cambridge. Um, and then there's another course run by um, Northumbria University, which is in uh, uh, Newcastle. Um, and there are varying entry requirements, um, but typically uh, you can be accepted if you have an undergraduate degree in either chemistry, um, art history or fine art. And um, so, you know, it's quite a multidisciplinary uh, course. You get people, you know, who have all sorts of different backgrounds and they teach you the stuff that you don't know. So I came in from an art history point of view, um, but I didn't know much about science. So then they gave me a sort of crash course in chemistry uh, for conservators, which was great. And like, I learned a lot and it's now really interesting. Um, Oh, important to say as well, you can't be colorblind. Uh, <laughs> you have to have full vision. <laughs> but other than that, um, I think that's it. I'm trying to think if there's any other uh, requirements. They, they look at your artworks. So if you have a portfolio as well, take that in. And they sort of, you know, as long as you can have a basic drawing and painting, um, then you should be OK. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So do you believe that there's room for any collaborations between local institutes in Trinidad and Tobago and Cotol to establish like an institute or program for conservation? Do you think there's room for that? Yeah, I definitely think there's room for that. I mean, I think the more collaboration between, I guess, places in the UK and Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean, or just, I guess, Europe and, and the Caribbean and the US and the Caribbean, anywhere um, is great. Um, I think, I do know that the Courtauld, I guess I don't work there, I was only a student there, but I know that they've definitely um, created existing links between museums and um, galleries in other countries. So I know they had a link, I can't remember the name, but it was some um, museum in India and they sent out a number of students to go and work on some paintings in India. So that could be sort of an initial uh, setup. Um, and then maybe, you know, like 
talking about, I guess, here in the UK, there's a lot of um, discussion at the moment about, uh, I guess, diversifying um, uh, all sorts of things from educational institutions, I guess, public institutions. And, you know, that starts by actually doing something, by creating connections with people from different countries and all over the world you know you've got to actually do something so it's very well saying we want to change our policies but if you don't actually change your policies so you know I think there's room um, I hope that in the future we can facilitate that and that we will create collaboration between local institutes in Trinidad and the UK and further afield. Um, I definitely agree because I think this is so beneficial to just all students, to establish artists, to museums, art galleries. It's so important, especially art in our culture. And we want this to last longer than even the artist's life with themselves. You know, we, you want to hold on to that and retain it. So I think it's so important. And I hope that in the future, there's a lot of spaces and avenues for more collaborations and for conservation to enter into the artistic space in Trinidad and Tobago. And yeah, right. yeah, I hope so. I hope so too. I think, you know, this is the start. Um, and I think that, yeah, the more we talk with one another, the more hopefully we can establish, whether it's a programme or encouraging people from Trinidad to, uh, to pursue a career in conservation. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so now I will open the floor to any questions that anybody in the audience has for Lucy about her work, about what we just discussed or anything like that. You could send it in the chat or you can raise your hand and we will come to you. Okay, so. I have the first question that was sent to me chat um, from Celine Perez. She asked, how did you take the sample not to damage the artwork? And was there a particular zone that was already damaged? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So you take, as you said, you take it from a, um, an area that's already damaged. So you sort of, we look under the microscope and identify somewhere that's either flaking paint um, Obviously, it's easier on older paintings because they tend to flake more. So there's more areas where you can take a and also the sample is only tiny, you know, it's literally like millimeters we're talking. So you can't really notice it in the painting. Um, but yeah, as you said, we take it from an area that's already damaged um, and then set it in the resin and you can see all the layers. OK, um, Robert Lee has a question. Yes, hi. Um, nice little talk. Did you have any chance to talk to any of the people who do art painting restoration in Trinidad? I know, no. of, two. I know of two, a German guy called Wolf and a Trinidadian painter called Lee Singh. Uh, because one of the problems here, of course, is the humidity and insects and the heat and so on. And um, uh, it, it is quite a challenge also. Um, uh, to sort of deal with foxing, which particularly affects watercolors. Mm. Um, and we don't have the facilities to really sort of uh, treat uh, some of these things. Um, yeah, I didn't actually get a chance to talk to anyone um, who is a painting conservator over there. But um, I mean, you've just mentioned two. So if anyone knows of anyone, I'd love to get in touch and, and talk more with them because obviously they know Sorry, my keyboard's falling off there. They know more about the specific issues to Trinidad than I would know. Um, and it, it's always good, as I said earlier, to have discussions with people. And, you know, I could learn so much from, from what they know and, and vice versa, hopefully. Um, it would be really interesting. Okay, thank you. No worries. So the next question comes from Valerie Taylor. Um, she asked, what are the implications of using non-traditional material on the life or longevity and value of paintings? And are there particular challenges for conservators? So, sorry, the first part, what are the implications, implications. of using 
yeah non-traditional um I guess it can it can affect the longevity of a painting um I wouldn't say it affects the value I don't think anything an artist uses ever affects the value of a painting because you know we we buy it because we like what the artist uses um but yeah it could definitely affect the longevity I mean we're also you know as as artists are becoming more and more experimental um we're we're facing issues where you know materials are behaving how we're not expecting them um so it's really a kind of work in progress we're trying to kind of what I'm doing you know talking to artists finding out what they're using how they're using it um and trying to understand how from a chemical point of view it might behave in the future um so that's that's what we're trying to do yeah and then the other part are there particular challenges for conservators uh I guess I mentioned that sort of briefly but yeah there are challenges um because we just don't know yeah a lot of materials are very um unpredictable in how they will and also as we've mentioned you know things behave differently in different climates uh, so something that's stable in Europe um in a more temperate climate may not be stable in a humid climate and vice versa so there's all these different implications that i guess are still being researched and there can still be more research into it definitely i guess the challenges will depend on just the the artwork itself and the location um so dean asks why not curatorial studies do your conservator colleagues double as curators um, no, so we are all uh, conservators. Um, in the UK, especially to become a curator, that's another postgraduate degree. <laughs> and I don't necessarily uh, have the time or inclination <laughs> to do that. Um, but also, I guess you do become or you can become an expert in a certain field. So you get to really know a lot of artists. Uh, simply by working on them you get to get a feel for their you know what they're saying through their art you get to actually see their brush strokes in person so for me I think I've never wanted to be a curator I've always wanted to be a conservator but that's not saying that you can't be both you know you can be someone who knows so much about art that you want to you know curate exhibitions and this that and collections and this that and the other um and you know let's not limit everyone you can do what you want to do really um, definitely um Akil down to a question he said to the artists on the call and lucy what is the present state and availability of conservation in trinidad and tobago and how can this be improved yeah good question i guess as um i think was it robert uh robert lee um mentioned there are obviously conservators in trinidad um i think that's probably one for the for the artists or or anyone else who knows anything about it to uh to talk about because it's it's something that i don't necessarily yeah i guess that wasn't my focus for the research so I'm also curious um, about that question. <laughs> Does anyone on the call want to answer that question if they can about the present state and availability? Okay. Uh, there's not much choice and um, I have inherited paintings which became damaged by uh, termites and, um, and foxing. Uh, the foxing I had cleaned at the Tate Laboratories in London and the, um, the termites, I had to rely upon the one person I knew who, I mean, did a, a, a sort of fair job, but I now realize there was a lot of heavy overpainting, which if I had to do it again, I would not. Uh, the other person I used was, uh, she's a painter herself, trained in a kind of classic way. And she was much more light and stuck to sort of very gentle cleaning and not touching things rather than sort of um, insinuating too much uh, overpainting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that particular painting had been um, on a seaside uh, hotel for some years 
and it was it had sort of evidence of um, previous damage um, with rotting of the canvas and so on. But the um, <clears throat> the person who owned the painting was quite pleased with what had been done. Another painting that she tried to um, to restore was a small painting by Ember, who is probably <clears throat> one of the well-known um, self-taught artists. And Ember was taken to making his own frames and decorating them with things like uh, pebbles, which he would varnish and so on. And this was almost impossible to clean because, you know, sort of over years, dust would get into things. And we discovered, you know, sort of uh, spiders and things living in the thing. But again, she cleaned it very gently. And the, um, the, the uh, person who owned the piece uh, was quite pleased. So we don't have much choice. I know that um, I have asked in the past Eddie Bowen to touch up things that have um, been done. I know he, he, you know, he's not a restorer and I didn't particularly care. Um, I just wanted something uh, uh, just touched up. But I think all the artists at some point uh, put their hand towards things. But we really do need people who can understand materials um, with all the experimental um, um, collages and so on. Um, materials are not meant to be, um, you know, sort of to be used in that way. I just collected a, a, a painting today, which um, was unfortunately painted on, on cardboard and it was slightly damaged on taking it out. And I'm now thinking, should I leave the damage and just have it framed or should I try to repair it or whatever? Um, and it's a problem again with climate and people um, not really realizing um, the fragility of the works and putting paintings on terraces can bleach them on white insects, um, um, the, uh, porch lights and so on can cause fading and damage. And we really need to sensitize people on how to keep things. I think Mark Pereira, who is a dealer here, uh, probably knows um, much better than I do on what is available locally um, for restoration and conservation and so on. Uh, the other thing is that um, some of the artworks which are not sort of painting, but sort of things that are made, I'm thinking particularly now in terms of carnival costumes, these also should be preserved. Um, we had the passing of a 95 year old masked man uh, two weeks ago and some of his, um, some of the things he made um, are in great danger of being destroyed and they really should be preserved for the national le legacy. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you so much yeah. for that insight. Yeah, thanks. That's, um, yeah, really interesting to hear. And I think also the way you mentioned that, you know, the two different handlings, so someone had a more sort of gun ho approach and then someone with a more minimal intervention, um, you know, as at, at uni, we're told that obviously you do a more minimal intervention approach. Like, you know, you don't overpaint huge areas of paint that's intact. You literally just retouch the bits of paint that has lost, um, that you've lost. So yeah, it's it sounds really interesting and it's nice to hear um, people doing things. And of course, yeah, um, termites is must be a big issue in um, and sort of pests and that kind of thing. But that's, you know, those are things that hopefully you can try and mitigate against just with good, um, good care of your collections um, and just letting people know, you know, that these things you should just try and avoid <laughs> as much as possible. Definitely. And it makes you realise the small details that goes into this, because just by the type of wood that you shoot, obviously, will depend on if too much will leave one, you know affect your piece of art and stuff like that. So it's very interesting. Um, I have a few questions from Dean. <laughs> um, he said that you mentioned regulations in conservation. What are these regulations? And also, do you get a license to practice as a conservator? Um, yeah, so there is a governing body um, in the UK. I can't. I know that there are other bodies as well in different countries um, in the US, but I'm not sure what they're called um, off the top of my head. But in the UK, there's a body called ICON, um, and they set out a number of, um, I guess, ethical codes and, and guidelines and regulations, you know, things like um, you shouldn't overpaint, um, you know, large areas, you can't change the composition, 
all of this, you know, making sure that you document um, the materials that you use, what you've done to a painting, you have good before and after photos, um, et cetera, et cetera, so that you can prove what you've done and prove that you haven't actually changed the painting. You've only, I guess, come in and, and conserved it, um, if that makes sense. Um, and do you get a license to practice? Um, you can, so you can become um, accredited. Again, that's the same body. So you have to take uh, yearly, I think it's yearly exams. Um, they come in, they sort of look at your practice, see what you're doing and just making sure that you are sticking to the ethical guidelines and you're up to date with um, materials, how to use materials, you know, what they might do to the paintings, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, are there any regulations surrounding? I know what part of the conservation process is almost mimicking what the artist does to try mm. to, to test it separately because you don't want to test the artwork and damage it, but to mimic what they do and then test it to see how it reacts and how it ages and stuff. Are there regulations surrounding that? And um, kind of how, like, after you replicate the artist work in a certain sense, like the disposal of it or the use of it after and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, that's really interesting because, as you said, we do we do a lot of um, yeah, like uh, replicas. We call them mimicking because um, you know you you don't as you said you don't want to test something on the artwork and then it's a complete disaster. Um, I guess I don't know. There aren't necessarily guidelines, um, but I guess we'll just keep them in the studios and use them for future reference if that makes sense. Um, so we'll we'll just keep those little replicas in the studio and just and also it's a way for us to understand how the materials might age. You can do um, artificial aging, so you can put things, uh, you know, in extreme heat for like uh, two weeks or two months or two years, and then you can see it sort of um, replicates the aging process for you. So you can test uh, new materials or test materials that artists are using and understand that. Um, but no, we tend not to throw them away. I guess we keep them, but usually we only use like really small sort of things like that size. So yeah, we won't sort of flog them on the on the black market. <laughs> okay. Um, next question from Dean again. <laughs> interested in this topic. Um, he asks, what equipment is required to set up a conservation lab, and can mm -hmm. you mention some of the equipment? Yeah, so it is quite a lot of equipment and it's quite a lot of expense. Um, I guess it depends, you know, there are some things that you really need. So if you need a good light, um, gosh, I'm trying to think, there's a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> a good light, I guess you need sort of solvents for cleaning, um, good brushes, paints for retouching, varnishes. So all your kind of like uh, materials that you'd use for conservation um you need space uh you need an easel uh we use um extraction so that's if you're using solvents that have fumes that sort of extracts the fumes so you don't get um negative health consequences um but i think yeah i don't know that's a hard one it's very specific like the equipment you use it's it is quite a lot and it, it is a cost which is why a lot of people don't set up their own studios, practices or labs because it is just um, a lot of expense, you know, it's an investment um, and it's a lot of money. So, um, oh, a microscope as well is handy. <laughs> Definitely, sounds like an investment for sure. Yeah, there's a lot. So the last question is from Elsa Clark. She asks, are you aware of a guiding text, not seminar papers, that Caribbean educators can access that assists in helping teachers make the adaptions needed in their instruction <clears throat> of students? So like anything that will help teachers with their students specific to the region and our climate? Yeah, I'm not sure, actually. I mean, there will be something out there, I'm sure. Um, maybe not necessarily um, targeted at the Caribbean, but I mean, you think there's a lot of tropical countries in the world and artists are everywhere, you know, like there's, yeah. you know, South America, Brazil, um, 
Caribbean, all over the world. So there, I, I reckon there will be something out there. I think I probably need to do a bit of sleuthing um, to find. But, you know, there's always uh, manuals that are taught in art school, um, this, that and the other. I guess there's also, um, from a conservation point of view, we have um, text. Um, from people who specialize in preventive conservation. So that's sort of the little like things that I was talking about that can help. Um, I guess it's like pest control, um, preparing for, uh, I guess, uh, weather events, so whether that's earthquakes, um, hurricanes, uh, storms, et cetera, et cetera. So making sure that you have these um, I guess, uh, methods and, and uh, things at your disposal that can, you know, prevention is better than the cure and that can really help. Um, but at the same time, I'd, I'd hate to sort of stifle artists, um, you know, and tell them you can't use that, you can't use this, because that's kind of getting rid of artists' creative expression and, and we don't want to do that. So it's, it's a really fine line. It's kind of working with artists and, and gathering information, finding out what they've used so we can treat it in the future, but also, I guess, making sure that they are just aware of like how their materials may behave. And obviously, all the artists working out here know full well how their materials behave, more so than, than I would, so, yeah. Um, I think that kind of highlights the, the need and the gap there is in terms of conservation within Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region, just seeing how different materials interact. So, so as she said, like as a teacher, from a teacher's point of view, she can now know how to um, educate her students better, like give them get different guidance and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Are there any more questions before we close? Um, I see Robert Lee is dropping some people who have some good conservation tips and conversations on YouTube. Oh. So if you want to know more about that, you can check the chat. Please drop it somewhere right now. <laughs> yeah. Any um, more? I, I was just going to say as well, if I put my um, email address and then if anyone wants the paper to read, you know, there's a bit more stuff in detail in there, um, or also just any questions um, and vice versa, I'd also like to hear more about um, people who are uh, practicing conservation in, in Trinidad. Definitely. Um, so since there are no more questions, I will now pass back to Mike to Raya um, to close. Thank you again, Lucy, for the conversation. It was oh, my no Thank you for, uh, for guiding. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yes, thank you so much, Lucy and Maya. We thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Any questions from the chat? We'll also like to thank everyone that contributed with those questions and also to those that shared their knowledge and expertise, thank you. So it was an absolute pleasure to be a part of this webinar with you, Lucy and Maya, and we at Data and Projects. We want to extend a sincere thanks to Lucy Fellows for being a part of the first session in our webinar series. So these conversations are extremely important and essential for current and upcoming artists as it makes their navigation of the artistic world easier. So on behalf of Data and Projects, I would like to thank Lucy Maya and Anna Powell, who was the former program assistant and helped us reach so far in this webinar and she helped us a great deal. And lastly, but not least, I would like to thank, well, Dad and Projects would like to thank every individual who tuned in to our discussion today. And a special thank you to all who contributed by sending in questions and by sharing their expertise. So we hope that our series allowed you to understand a new aspect of art and the various roles involved in the artistic process and also in the conservation process of art. And uh, I would also like to remind the audience to leave their contacts in the chat if you wish to be kept informed, or you can also reach out to us through the social media pages. So you can message us from the social media pages if you're interested in getting any information or any updates or anything else. So when you follow us on the social media, we'll be able to update you through there as well. So thank you everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the session. 
as well. So good evening, everyone. Thank you.